I don't know about you, but there are times when you go through difficulties, when you're under pressure, you can feel as strong as iron. And those are wonderful, wonderful times. I believe that God wants us to be able to face challenges being strong as iron. The reality is that it's a growing experience. It's not something that happens at the flip of a switch or overnight. Growing in faith to where you're strong under pressure takes time and a process. But what would it be like if I put this egg in here and I just tighten this vice up? Maybe I need to put this on the floor. To... Let's see what happens. Anybody want to come turn this? Nobody's jumping up as a volunteer. Lot I. But I tell you what, if there's a picture that helps us comprehend what we often feel like under pressure, it's not this. The kind of pressure that builds your faith is when you feel like this. When you have to lean on somebody that's bigger than you are, on something that's greater than you. It doesn't take faith when you know you can stand the test, when you can hold the ground. But it takes faith when you feel as fragile as an egg. Now on my son's farm, they have these hard eggs. Now I don't know what they're made out of. I wanted to go get one before I came in this morning and really pull one on you. But they are solid as a rock. And you could put that in there and tighten it up. And it's to help provoke the chickens to lay eggs. You know, it's a, it's a disguise and help them to lay eggs. But the only way you can be strong is to have Jesus on the inside. That's growing in faith. Building faith under pressure is a very, very challenging thing. It's a very challenging time. A few weeks back in James chapter 2, there were three verses of Scripture that we mentioned. I want to mention them again. I want to mention verse 17. It says, thus also faith itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Faith without works is, somebody say it. Faith without works is what? Dead. Dead, dead faith. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Come back to that again in a minute. But verse 20 says, but you, you want to know, O oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead. Some of your versions will have the word useless there or some simile. Because there's two different words for dead that, that are used in this chapter. In verse 17, there's a word ne necros. And in verse 20, there's the word arge. And, and in, in verse 17 it's the same word for dead that's used in verse 26 so let's go down to verse 26 and read again for as the body without the spirit is dead so faith without works is dead, dead. what does it mean to be dead it means there's no life in you there's nothing left it's gone in other words dead faith is worse than no faith at all if you, have, if you have no faith, that means you can get some faith. Or you may have struggling faith. But if you have dead faith, this is what it means. You had faith of some kind, but it gave up the ghost. It gave up the spirit. It gave up the life. Whatever faith you had has died. Dead faith. Dead faith is evidenced by those who say they believe but have no works to back it up there's nothing to really show that there's any faith there are a lot of people who say they have faith or that they believe but we must remember that even the devils believe but that doesn't mean they're saved even the devils believe but there's no works there's nothing to back that up and so 
I run into people all the time that say, I believe, I have belief, or I got my salvation back in 1902 or something. You know, I'm just, when I was seven, I went to an altar and, and I wept and I cried and, and then bless God that evening, they took me out to the lake and they baptized me or the creek. Well, what's life been like since that? And that's been 50 years ago. I've just been living like a pure heathen. I mean, I'm just as, I'm just this, that, and the other. And I'm like, what happened? Faith without works is dead. It, there's, there has to be something that connects with our believing. And this so gripped me, and I was reading through the book of James, and, and I have a list of some 21 different ways that faith works in James. But I want to just talk to you about one of them this morning. I want to talk to you about building faith under pressure. And I want you to go with me to James chapter 1, verse 2. James chapter 1, verse 2 says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. I mean, I just, let's just stop a minute. This is hilarious. What are you talking about, count it joy? Anybody in here have a reason to be happy today? Oh, no, come on now. Get with it. Anybody in here have a trial going on in your life? <laughs> then the word says, what does the Bible says? Count it all joy. Do you, does anybody in here have a reason to have joy? Yes. Amen. Put a smile on your face. It's a good thing. God's up to something good. Either God's word is true and we can do this. Or God's word is irreasonable or unreasonable and irrational and impractical and has nothing to do with our life. And I want to say to you that God's word is solid, that it's strong, that it's truth. That when you take God's word over your experience and over your circumstances, you start to build faith. You don't build faith when everything's going good. You build faith when things are going bad. You build faith when your feet are in the fire. You build faith when your world's falling apart and you're still holding on. I can't count the times I've done funerals for people who had no church and they had no pastor. And the number of times that I'll go into a service and, and somebody will have died for some reason, you know, God only knows why, and it was a tragic loss, maybe young or something, and, and the people would, would pick out a song, something like, How Great Thou Art. Because it's a song their heart connected to. And I just look at those dear people. And they've had no church. They've had no relationship with God. But they want a pastor to come in and help them. And they want to sing how great thou art. There's something that in the depth of that battle they are realizing. That I may not understand the trouble I am in. The pain I am in I don't like and it's difficult. But I am going to declare how great God is. There's something of faith that can rise up inside of you in the darkest moments, in the deepest, darkest times of your life where that faith begins to arise. And so he says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Building faith under pressure in, involves, you know, stepping into places of trial and counting it joy. But let's read on. Verse 3 says, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Number, I want you just to, well, let's just read on knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. And verse four says, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Now, there are three word phrases in there I want to call your attention to. The first one is in verse two, where it says, count it all joy, count it, the, the phrase count it. And I want to talk to you about counting it in just a minute. The second word phrase I want to talk to you about is in verse 3, knowing that. And I want to talk to you about knowing that. And the third word phrase I want to talk to you about is in verse 4, where it says, but let patience. And I want to talk to you about let patience. And when we talk about these things, I believe it will help you to be able to have joy under pressure and have faith under pressure. When we talk about building faith under pressure, I want you to know that's not the strange thing or the odd thing. It's the common thing in Christianity. 
Throughout the Bible, even in Jesus' days, when he was building faith in his disciples, they were constantly running into conflict, and he was constantly teaching them to trust him. Throughout the life of the New Testament church, there were troubles that would come and they would count it an honor to be in trials and in difficulties because they knew somehow in that difficulty, God was going to be glorified. God was doing something in them. God was doing something in his message. There is something of faith that's beyond the circumstances that has to arise. I got to thinking about this and I thought there are a couple of other places in the Bible that talk to us about building our faith. And we often quote them without realizing what's going on. Hold your finger in James chapter 1, but if you can, turn with me to, back to the left to Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. Because in verse 17, there is this famous scripture that says, So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And that just sounds easy. Faith comes by hearing. All I've got to do is hear the word and I'm going to have faith. The reality is that you need to understand the context of this. And if you go back up and read in verse 16, and actually verse 14 says, How then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. Listen to verse 16. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? And I want you to see two things in that verse 16. Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So he is saying there has been some preaching going on, but there has been some believing that hasn't occurred. We can hear a lot of things, but that doesn't mean we believe it. We can have information in our mind, but that doesn't mean that it becomes something that we are base our life on and we're going to use it to guide our life. The way you see if they have believed it or not is found in this same verse. Because in the first part of that verse, verse 16, they have not all obeyed the gospel. So he says, who has believed? How do we know they haven't believed? Because they haven't obeyed. And here's the key. If you believe something, there has to be an obedience with it. There has to be a yieldedness to it. There has to be an acceptance of the truth of God in your life where it applies to you. So if you're going to grow in faith, you have to believe. It's not just hearing. I don't want you to just think that you can read through the Gospels and just pour it into you and just think, oh, I'm going to have faith. No, when you get to that part that says love your enemy, when you get to that part that says forgive those who have done you wrong, brother, you've got to take those things in and say, okay, God, I'm going to obey your word. Growing in faith is hearing, believing, and obeying the word of God. You know, there's another place that that reminds me of, and it's in the book of Jude, but this is going to make you a little uncomfortable. Anybody want to get a little uncomfortable before God? That's what I thought, not many of you. But I want to go there anyway, because I think we need to see it. I believe we need to hear this, Jude, because we're talking about building faith in difficulty. And so in Jude, in Jude, (laughs) oh my goodness. Jude verse 20, I want you to see what it says. But you beloved, who's he talking to? The beloved of the Lord. Isn't that beautiful? How many of you are glad you're the beloved of the Lord? How many of you believe you're the beloved of the Lord? (laughs) Well, let me ask you a question. If you're married, how many of you have a spouse that you would call them beloved, even though sometimes things weren't going good? Come on, you know what I'm talking about. So how many of you believe God still loves you and you're the beloved when things aren't going good? Come on now, that takes faith. Beloved of the Lord. And he says, he says, but you beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. And I want you to see that God says there's something that has to happen. You are the beloved, but this is what you've got to learn to do. You've got to build yourself up on your most holy faith. 
In other words, you take what you have and you keep yourself strong in the faith. How am I going to keep myself strong in the faith? And this will only apply to some of you here. Because not everybody in here has been filled with the Holy Spirit and spoken in tongues. Some of you have, some of you haven't, that's okay. But how many of you, don't raise your hand, but have ever spoken in tongues as the Holy Spirit gave you utterance? That's called praying in the Spirit. How many of you have ever maybe worshipped in tongues, worshipped in the Spirit? Brother, I wasn't raised around that, but I've learned that I can pray in English, but there's something about praying in the Spirit as the Holy Spirit gives you unction about worshiping in the Holy Ghost that takes you into a place that you can't get into with, without God. He says, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. I want to say to those of you that are in here that know how to pray in the Spirit and worship in the Spirit, you need to do it more than you ever have before. You need to stir up that gift that is inside of you. If you've never worshiped God in spirit, if you've never prayed in the spirit, ask the Holy Spirit to take you there, to fill you, and to give that to you. Because it's one of the ways that we build ourselves up in the faith. We live in a time where we don't need less people praying in the spirit. We don't need less people worshiping in the spirit. We need more people worshiping in tongues and in praying in tongues that sets the atmosphere of heaven. Hallelujah. There needs to be more people who understand this dynamic. And oh, by the way, I want to just give some of you a pass card. Because some of you will say, but pastor, if they speak in tongues, shouldn't it be interpreted? If they're talking to you, yes. But when they're talking to God, that's between them and God. If I'm praying to the Lord and worshiping God, that's between me and him. There is an overflow of the Holy Spirit that lifts up that language to the Lord. There are times around here where we may be singing songs we all know. But what happens if we start, step out into this place where certainly the Spirit of God catches us away and our hands are lifted up and out of our voice or come this worship of God and we start worshiping God in other languages as the Holy Spirit gives an utterance. I'll tell you what's going to begin to happen because I was there before I ever spoke in tongues. I've been in those kind of meetings when I didn't know what it meant to speak in tongues. But something would begin to happen inside of this boy that came from another background. And something would begin to move up and down my spine. I would know that the presence of God was in the place. I might not have understood it, but I felt the presence of God. When you want to build your faith, you need to experience the presence of God. You need to come into his presence and stir that up. Faith started to rise, building up your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Well, what I wanted you to see about that is up above there in verse 16, because it's talking about the end times, and he's saying, this is what you need to do, build up yourselves on your most holy faith. And about the end times, he says, I'm talking about building up your faith, and I haven't even got to, I haven't got to James yet. We'll get back there in a minute. Hold on to your seat, Sally. We'll get there. We're talking about the end times and the need to build up your faith. Building up your faith under pressure. Because verse 16 says, these are grumblers, complainers, walking according to their own lust. Stop. Grumbling, complaining, walking. <laughs> Anybody had any grumbling encounters this week? Anybody had any complaining? <laughs> you know, and the Bible tells us why it's there. They're walking according to their own lust. When grumbling and complaining, our world is inundated with grumbling and complaining. And it says, walking according to their own lust. What does that tell us? The more we become carnal, the more we become saturated with what I want to be and what I want to do, it's going to come out as grumbling and complaining. Does anybody like to live in an environment of grumbling and complaining? Do you believe the grumbling and complaining is dialing up in our world? How are we going to stand in this world? We've got to have a faith that is beyond that. We've got to have a faith that is deeper than that, that goes deeper than that. We've got to have something that's just more than shell deep. You've got to have something that more than just an identity. On the outside of this egg, you might not see it, but there's an 
E-B on it, I think. Eglin's Best. It stands for Eglin's Best because that's the kind of egg my wife buys. And it stands that with an E-B. I want to tell you something, friend. You need more, something more than a stamp on you. You need the power of the Holy Spirit inside of you stirred up, not something from yesterday. It needs to be right now full of the Holy Spirit and the faith of God. He goes on and says, he says, verse 17 well, let's see, working according to their own lust, verse 16, and, and they, they mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. Does that sound like our world or what? Verse 17, but you, beloved. And this is where it comes hard to get into faith. Because we live into a world where there's a lot of stuff going on. There are a lot of things that are being said, but not a lot of it is glorifying God. In fact, it'll aggravate your flesh. It'll get you stirred up in the flesh. It'll get you wanting to say stuff you shouldn't think and think about things you shouldn't think about. And so, and the Bible says, but you beloved, but you beloved. He is saying, listen, I have a people. God is saying, I have a people that's in this world and you're living in this environment. But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 18, how they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lust. Do you know I saw a news blip the other day about Disney World. And, and it was, a, a you know, and, and Governor DeSantis in Florida has stood up for parents and children and, you know, saving, didn't want young children to be indoctrinated with stuff about sex change and gender identity and all of that. Praise God for a governor who will make a stand. Can you say amen? amen. But then in the news articles, you get lamb blasted. All these religious zealots, all these right ring fanatic, f- fanatics, brother and sister, you got to get ready for this. You've got to open your eyes and realize. If you're going to trust the word of God, we are in the kind of time where not everything that is said in this world is going to be something that makes you feel comfortable. But you've got to determine, are you going to trust God? Are you going to hold on to God? You can't put this thing in a closet somewhere and pretend like it doesn't exist. When you talk about having faith under pressure, you've got to recognize the times that we are in. When you bow your heads to pray at a meal and somebody snickers across the way. When you you say something of encouragement to someone about the Lord and, and somebody says, oh, just stop that foolishness. No, brother, I'm telling you, you've got to learn to stand up for the word of God and for the God that you have confidence in. And so this is the kind of people that God was speaking to. You, beloved, remember the words which were spoken, how they told you. Verse 18, there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to what? Their own ungodly lust. These are sensual persons who cause divisions, not having the spirit. And what is he saying? There are a lot of people who learn, have learned to live a carnal life. And what, what I've got to go back and just tell you is that every one of us came out of a carnal life. Every one of us came out of a background that has all of this in it. And what, if you're not careful, those same tendencies will be in you and you may want to go back to some of those carnal ways. You may want to slide back, but you've got to pray in the Holy Spirit. You've got to hear the Word of God. You've got to get the Word of God living inside of you, believing it and obey it. You've got to have the touch of God in your life. You've got to have the Holy Spirit working inside of your life. Not something that happened yesterday, not something that happened 50 years ago there needs to be an ongoing everyday encounter with the word of God and the Holy Spirit in your life keeping you stirred up I just want you to know when you talk about building prayer faith under pressure this is what we're talking about but we could dial it right down to every individual life in here and every person in here take the rest of the world away have probably had circumstances this past week that caused something inside of you to want to stir back up that wasn't pleasing to Christ because some kind of pressure could have come your way and suddenly you had an idea suddenly you had a thought suddenly you had something inside of you that was different than what God was supposed to be inside of you I don't know how that makes you feel but it doesn't make me feel good I don't like to admit it when those things happen. I don't like to feel it when it happens. But the truth is it happens. 
One of the things I'm happy about is God sent the Holy Spirit to bring conviction into me, to let me know that if I say, well, the world's doing this, but God says, you're not of this world. Oh, Jesus. That he convicts me of his righteousness. And he reminds me, I died for you for a reason. To buy you out of that unrighteousness and to put my righteousness inside of you. And the Holy Spirit will convict you that you're supposed to live. You've been made the righteousness of God in Christ. Oh, come on now. How many of you believe it? How many of you believe it? The Bible says he has made us the righteous. Then if I have, then there are times when my flesh isn't going to feel that righteousness. And I've got to get down before God and turn my heart back to the Lord, turn from that which was pulling me down and say, but God, but God, but God, but God in Christ, you've given me something that is beyond me. And ask him to fill you with that again hallelujah hallelujah we've got to learn to walk in the holy spirit you know i think about five times in the bible the the, the bible uses the term, maybe four or five times i can't remember uses the term parakletos which is the term that in some places translated comforter some places it's translate or in some versions translates it helper and it means the same thing that there is a time where the holy spirit comes alongside of you and he comforts you That means he says, don't get too upset. I still got you. I knew you were going to hit this bump in the road before the bump ever got there. (laughs) Anybody ever woke up, I mean, ever started a day and you went to bed at night and think, what did I wake up this day for? You know, can I just tell you everything that's going on in this day? I want you to know before the sun ever rose on that day, God knew that day was coming and he provided a comforter. He provided the Holy Spirit to be your helper. He will come alongside of you. But I've always found he's a gentleman. He's not going to come in if you don't want him to. But if you invite him in and you stir him up, he will be there. If you walk aware of his presence, he will be there. He will keep you strong in the Lord and in the power of his might because that's what the Holy Spirit is for. One of the few places that the word parakletos is used in the Bible is of Jesus, where he says, if any of us sin, we have, we have a, an advocate with the Father. In, in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, if anybody sins, we have an advocate with the Father, which is Christ Jesus. Do you know what Jesus is doing for you when you sin? He's by the right hand of the Father advocating for you. He is comfort. He is parakletosy. He is saying, I reach down here and I grab hold of Maxwell by one hand and I reach up here and I get hold of the throne by the other and I bring them both together and we just have to get into agreement with what the Lord is doing and believe that that the Lord is doing that and the Holy Spirit is the one that tells us what Jesus is doing he reminds us what the Lord is doing he says whatever I'm doing he's going to make known to you and he's saying I'm bringing you back in there what if I come into a place when I'm sick brother when I'm sick last week I don't even know I don't even remember seeing your faces I don't know what was going on last week I spent two days in the hospital they run more tests than I can shake a stick at one thing they found was I had a brain another thing they found was I had a heart they found out I had a whole lot of organs and a lot less blood when I came out but I had blood when I went in (laughs) they were saying (laughs) I'm just saying oh brother I want you to know there just came a time I don't even know what was happening but I'll tell you this they don't know either by the way they gave me a clean bill of health but I want to tell you something there is something that happens when you get into a place where you can't but even though you can't there's a God who can and you raise your spiritual hand up past those things that are natural and say but God but God Jesus you are my healer Jesus you are my Lord I think I probably told you about this last week if I did and I repeat it just forgive me I have an excuse for repeating it I don't remember everything last week but I do want to tell you that when my daughter-in-law went into the hospital to birth this baby and all this team of doctors said there is no hope one or the other of you will die and I said to her you know we need to remind them as wonderful as they are and as thankful as we are there is the great physician 
How? I said there is the great physician. And the great physician has no limits, has all skill, has all knowledge. There are some people in here that ought not have been here. Last week, Roger was here. Hugh and Deborah's son, Roger was here. Roger White, that just not too long ago, he should have been dead. In fact, he died. He died. But God, I'm telling you, when you're not supposed to be able to get into an intensive care room in the middle of COVID, but by the grace of God, not only did we get in, but so did God. God got in there and changed everything. I'm telling you, this young man, I don't know, how old is he now? 41, 2, something. 48, 48, okay. Well, anyway, I don't know how long it started. He went forever. I'm telling you, it took him forever to get back to health. But here's what I'm telling you. When you reach through the veil of the flesh and you hold on to God, there's a God who can do anything. I said, there's a God who can do anything. There are sometimes you just have to trust God. How many of you know what I'm talking about? How many of you have ever felt weak in your flesh and you just had to say, God, I need a power that is greater than me. I need a truth that is greater than me. I need a, I need a force that is outside of me. Brother, when I was laying in the hospital bed last Sunday evening, I, the nurses kept asking me, why did you come to the hospital? And I said to every one of them, because my wife told me to. That's a good answer. <laughs> Lord Jesus, help us all. <laughs> Woo! But I'll tell you, there's a hand that's bigger than any man's hand, and it's God's hand. Amen? Amen. I better get to the message. Yeah, because my wife has good wisdom. Absolutely. Are you still in James? My goodness, I've gotten so far off course. I had you in Jude. Let's go back to James. Hallelujah. Just back a few pages. Hallelujah. Building faith under pressure. The three phrases, counting it, knowing that, and letting patience. But first I want to talk to you about various trials. What is a trial? A trial is an adverse circumstance or an affliction or trouble that just comes on you and you just don't have any choice about it. It's just there. And you don't like it. And sometimes if you ask you, you sure don't deserve it. Come on. Anybody ever get an adverse circumstance and you're just thinking, what happened to me? Why me? Count it all joy. There comes some times where you just have to believe that in spite of everything else that God has you and he knows what's going on and I'm going to count it joy. I may not understand. I may not have an explanation, but I'm going to count it joy. That word joy refers to a grace that's been given to you. That word grace is the unmerited favor of God. But let me tell you what more it means. It means God is leaning into you. It's more than favor that you don't deserve. It means God leaning in, that he is leaning into you. And when God leans into you and you sense him leaning into you, there's something that changes in you. That's something that recognizes the presence of God. When the Bible talks about joy, it is a word, it is a cognate, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, a tr- part of the word grace is in there. And and it, uh, and it talks about joy. It's talking about a grace, a j- grace that says God is leading in. And because God is leading in, there's a joy inside of me. Why is that joy inside of me? Because though the pressure is on the outside, there's joy on the inside. Though this outward man is perishing, something is happening on the inside of me because God is leaning into me. So there's a joy inside of me. The problem with the spiritual things of God is you can't always feel them right away. They don't always evidence themselves right away. So as a believer, you have to start deciding to have joy before the answer ever shows up. You have to say, I'm going to have joy even when there's no joyful reason there. You're going to have to say, I trust God because I'm having breakthrough faith here. And my faith is going to another level. God's taking me beyond where I've been into someplace I've never been before. And though I don't understand 
understand this. I'm going to choose to have joy in the Lord. I'm going to choose to bless his name. I'm going to choose to praise him. And it's the beginning of a breakout of faith inside of you. But it call, Because it causes you to look past everything external and to only see and know God. One of the reasons why for me praying in the spirit is so powerful. Because you have to let your mind go. You have to let your physical body go. You have to let your emotions go. And you just let the Holy Spirit roll through you. And brother, that is dependence on God to give you what man can't give you. And believing that what he's bringing forth out of you is powerful and mighty and pray in the mind of God. That's what I believe when I pray in the Spirit. I let everything else go. When you start getting in a battle where you need the Lord to help you, it'll bring you to a place where you have to lay down your mind's ability, your flesh ability, your emotional ability, and say, but God, God is greater than whatever I'm going through. Joy. When you go into all these temptations, these trials, these places of test, these tests, and whenever you go through a trial and you get under a trial and you're in these adverse circumstances, when you're, under, when you're in a trial before a judge, what is the judge putting you on trial for? He is trying you to see if the evidence before him is true. Boy, whenever I thought about that, I thought, God, I pray that whatever we're trial we're going through will produce evidence that says we are a child of God, that we have been bought by a price, that we've been redeemed by the blood, that we know the truth, that we've been moved out of one kingdom and into another kingdom, that we know how to turn our heart back to God, that we don't fear losing him or him walking away from us even when it's been bad. I trust the Lord. I want to be examined and still know that my God is for me. He is not against me. He prayed a price to redeem me. When you go through a trial, it's the make an examination and see if it's real. I don't know about you but I've failed enough tests in my life. I really liked it when I was in university and in university when they graded scales on a curve. How many of you ever blew a test in college and they came back and said, don't worry, whatever the highest grade is, it could have been a 50. Well, that's going to be an A and on down the line and maybe there. Anyway, I just want you to know something, brother. God gives us what we need. Can you say amen? He gives us the grace for the journey. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Trial can also be the process by which the qualities of something are brought out. And I have been in test that there were qualities that came out of me were not pleasing to God. <laughs> I've learned that life in the kingdom is a process. And that there are sometimes the process of fire brings out the dross in me. How many of you know what dross is? Anybody know what dross is in silver? Like if they mine silver and they want to purify silver, they'll put it in a fire and they'll heat it up and they'll skim the, the dross, the dredging off of it. How, how many of you know what pure gold? I'm told that pure gold is clear. I don't know. I've never seen pure gold. I've seen different kinds of gold. But I just want you to know, it, it, when gold first comes out of the ground, it's not pure. There's a lot of trash in it, but it has to go through the fire. When you go through the fire to bring the value out of you, you go through a trial, you've got to trust God. It, it may be because there's something in me that God wants to scoop out. And by the way, there might be some characteristic in me that what I'm going through reveals something in me. I've got to say, thank you, Lord, for bringing it to the forefront. You know what most of us do? We put it in back to the Eden. And we say, well, let me hide this. Let me make an excuse. Let me put it on this one or that one. No, just come before the Lord. Say, Lord, you done made this real. Let's don't hide this sucker anymore. Let's get it right out there for God and everybody. And God, I'm just going to yield that up to you. I'm going to turn from it. And I'm going to turn to you and say, God, help me. Amen. Hallelujah. Isn't that much better? <laughs> Hallelujah. There are characteristics when there are qualities in us. It shouldn't be there. Trials reveal that kind of thing. So they have an importance and they have a place in our life. They have a place of trusting God and trying to, to, to just trust him in everything that's going on. So he says in, in uh, oh, count it. When he talks about counting it, what does he mean? He says, look at this. He says, my brethren, count it all joy. In other words, this is what he's saying. He is saying, I want you to be the leading authority. He says, count it. 
He says, I want you to be in control of this. I don't want you to tell the devil. I don't want you to let the devil tell you what to think about it. I don't want you to let your neighbor to tell you what to think about it. I don't want Facebook or social media to tell you what to think about it. I want my word to tell you what to think about it. I don't want somebody else who's maybe in a battle that's falling apart to try to tell you what to think about it. I want you to step in and I want you to take control. I want you to be the first person on the scene. When trouble starts coming, I want you to count. I want you to step up. I want you to be number one and I want you to count it joy. You make a decision. You make a legislative decision. You decide right then and there, this thing is not going to have me. I'm going to have it by the help and grace of Almighty God. I'm going to count it joy. I'm determining it's going to be a good thing and all things work together for good. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is where a lot of us lose it because we don't realize we have to count it. We have to make a decision. I may not like it, but I'm counting it as good. I know that he makes all things work together for good. And so therefore I'm taking the lead in this situation. I'm renewing my mind like Revelation 12 says, and I'm determined that this is gonna work for good. I'm taking captive every thought like 2 Corinthians 10 says. I'm not letting these thoughts of defeat, of agony, of sorrow, of depression, of despair, come up inside of me. No, I'm casting them down. And I'm saying yes to the Lord. All things work together for good to those who love the Lord, who are the called according to his purpose. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You've got to learn to count it. Number two, not only do you have to learn to count it, but you have to learn to lean into that joy of the Lord. But not only do we count it, we also have to know it. The Bible says knowing that. Knowing what? Knowing that the testing of your faith produces. How many of you have had faith tested? All right. Look at this. It says the testing of your faith what? How many of you have ever put money in something as an investment? And it lost money. And it's like, that didn't produce squat. <laughs> it's called farming, huh? <laughs> A lot of times that's the case. You can invest yourself in something and it leaves you empty. But I want to tell you in the name of the Lord, most of us invested ourselves in a lot of stuff before Jesus that left us empty. Come on now. And if the devil can make you think that when you're going through something, you're going to be left empty. Come on now. You know I'm telling you the truth. You'll be going through something and the enemy be saying to you, you're going to come up empty. You're coming up on the short end of the stick. Nothing's going to work out for you. Brother, I want you to know this is where faith works. Faith says I'm counting it joy. Faith also says I know that what's going on is producing something in me that is beyond me that is outside of me that's from another world and I'm not looking at the things that are seen but I'm looking at the things that are unseen I am looking at the things of almighty God and I will stand until they come through hallelujah hallelujah man that reminds me of a scripture 2 Corinthians chapter 4 it just happens to be one of my favorites so I'm going to turn over there and read it Verse 16, therefore, we do not lose heart. Anybody ever lost heart before? Come. Oh, man, come on. Anybody ever just been depleted? It wasn't a heart thing. It was a spirit thing, I felt. One time years ago, I've shared this with you before. I was in a situation, and I said to the Lord, Lord, what that person did took the wind out of my sail. God said to me, not out loud, what I felt him say in my inner being is if that took your breath away, then you're getting your breath from the wrong source. Yeah. So when it says, therefore, do not lose heart, what that says to me is I can depend upon other things for the innermost part of my being, the joy, the heart, the life that is there, or I can depend upon God. And sometimes you go through stuff 
that will challenge where your heart is anchored. What is your heart anchored into? What are you finding your life in? Where does your real hope lie? Therefore, we do not lose heart. Even though, I like this, our outward man is perishing. So let me tell you, last Sunday, when this preacher stood up here to speak to you, I'm sitting over there. Before church, I didn't know what time church began. I asked Pastor Roy, what time does church begin? I'm sitting over here by Nancy. Am I supposed to go up there now? What do I do next? I totally did not know. I asked her, I said, is it Easter? Is Tiffany, do we have a baby and baby and Tiffany's in the hospital? I mean, I didn't, I wasn't sure of anything. All I knew was I had a Bible I had some, some things the Lord had put in my heart. I said, Lord, this outward man is as perished as he can be right now and still walk up there. But I'm going to step up there and trust you, Holy Spirit. I'm not complaining. I'm celebrating Jesus. I'm celebrating the blood of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. And I'm telling you in the name of the Lord. I was able to share with you. I pray it was helpful to somebody. But there comes times in your life where you have to step out and say, I don't have what it takes. But because of that, I'm stepping out and I'm trusting God. I walked through it when I first tried to tell somebody about the Lord or share his word with them. I don't have what it takes. Get over. You don't have what it takes. He has what it takes. Your outward man needs to perish, needs to get out of the way. You need to step into what he has. I'll never forget the first time I started to pray for somebody and I thought, man, that's bad. I don't have what they need to help them. You step past what you don't have. It's never about what you have. It's about laying down your flesh so that you can depend on him and trust in him so you can know that it's God that's working in you. And God specializes in taking people who have nothing, who are nothing, who can't do it and just say, but God, you said, and I trust you and I trust your power power because I don't have what it takes you have what it takes I'm telling you in the name of the Lord if I could stand up here and preach last Sunday you can live for Jesus you can stand for the Lord you can pray for the sick you can cast out devils you can do anything God gives you to do hallelujah, hallelujah. you can overcome you can run through a troop you can leap over a wall the inward man's being renewed day by day Verse 17 says, for our light affliction. <laughs> the, the, one, the one thing you don't do is when somebody's in trouble, go tell them that's just light. Can I get a witness? <laughs> yeah, no. No, I'm not. If you're in trouble, I'm not going to tell you that's just light thing. But Paul said our light affliction. What was he saying? He's saying there's something so much better than this. That what I'm going through is nothing. Come on, nothing compared to the goodness of what God is doing. Which is but for a moment is working for us. There you go again, working for. Somebody say, working for me. Trouble is producing for you every time. Woo! <laughs> Come on, trouble is producing for you how many times let me put it like this you can't lose for winning <laughs> oh come on you ought to give the lord a praise offering you can't lose for winning that's all right verse 18 while we do not look at the things which are seen When you're going to walk by faith and you're under pressure, you have to learn to take your eyes off the stuff that's obvious. Anybody can tell you the obvious. When you're building faith, you learn to stand on what nobody else can see. You learn to hear what nobody else maybe can hear. 
you learn to trust a source other than the sources of this world. You learn that there is a greater power. And we know what that greater power is. That greater power is the Lord God Almighty. Can you say amen? amen. For the things which are seen are temporary. <laughs> How many of you have some trouble around you that it just looks like it's going to go on and on? Did anybody ever have trouble? You just think this is never ending? The devil is a liar. Come on, the devil is a liar. The word says it's only temporary. But the things which are not seen, the peace of God, the joy of God, the strength of God, the healing of the Lord, the keeping of the power of God, angels on assignment, the love of God, those things are eternal. They are unmovable and unshakable. And we just have to come to a place where we can trust them and stand in them. Can you say amen? So there, it's a matter of knowing the testing is producing in us and it's producing uh, patience, which is the same thing as endurance. Somebody say endurance. Yeah. Endurance. When I think about endurance, we have some people in here that are, are marathoners. I am not one of them. I thought about getting me one of those shirts and where it says it has 26 on it. How many of you know what 26 means? 26 miles. 26 miles. It would be a lie. But I just thought it would look good. Does anybody have any idea how many steps there are in a 26 mile run? I don't know. But if you stopped and counted the steps and you thought I'm at number one and I've got to get to whatever the last one is. And I meant to try to figure this up this week and I forgot. But that's okay. Let me tell you something. How many? 274,560. 247,000, 274,560, 274,560, 274,560, yes sir, <laughs> no, but if, I, but, it, but if I think all I've got to do is put one foot, then another foot, and then another foot. Then another foot. I know you get tired of me talking about my family, but I've got a 10-year-old grandson who just built a chicken coop on wheels. A mobile chicken coop. Hold, I don't know, 40 or 50 chickens. All by himself. Put the axles on, everything. My son printed it all out in a book for him, and, and my son oversaw it. He had an eight-year-old brother that helped him sometimes. <laughs> But he built this chicken coop. When I was his age, I'd have took one look at that and said, whoa. How did he build that chicken coop? He measured one board at a time. He measured every board, made the mark, took the square, drew the line. My son cut it. If it wasn't cut right, it was because my grandson didn't mark it right. They didn't lose a board. He drilled holes through metal for the axles to go in, all this stuff. I'm just telling you. How did he build it? One step at a time. What I'm telling you is walking by faith is not something you look to the end of. Building something that lasts is not something you have to have a plan and you take one step at a time. And some of you don't try to get out of alignment. Don't try to leap ahead when you're back here. Don't try to fix the complete picture when God says it's one step at a time. Some of you are looking at your life and say, I'm running out of energy. I'm running out of stamina. No, let me tell you, stamina is the ability to stay with it, to stick with it. Some of you need some stick with it -ness. You need some stamina. You need to stand in there and say, I'm keeping on walking. I've ran long races before. I am not one of them today, but I've done it before and I know what it means to break through that barrier where you get your second win. Now, when I was a boy and my legs were strong and my body was a little bit younger, once I got the second win, I felt like I could have been run forever. What was that guy's name that, that was on television that ran forever? 
Forrest, man, I felt like Forrest Gump. Just point me and say, go. Come on now. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I'm not there today, but I know what it means. What I want to tell you is some of you are at the point of breakthrough. And God wants you to get your second wind. He said, don't stop where you are. Press through. Press on through. Step into the stamina of what God has for you. Stay with it. Hang with it. Go through. You'll get your second wind. And you'll, oh, hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord.